We are uh, starting episode three of volume two of our sermon series called The Saga. And uh, this is a five-month sermon series. We don't tend to do sermon series that long, but we are this time. It's a five-month sermon series. Uh, We're taking a look at the chronological life of Christ. And because it's five months, we broke it down into three volumes. Um, This is actually volume one. I'm so sorry I said volume two. I I misspoke there. It's volume one. Uh, We started this a few weeks ago. We looked at the birth of John the Baptist foretold. We'd look at Elizabeth and Zachariah's story. Uh, Last week, we took a look at, of course, at Mary and her um, encounter with the angel Gabriel. And this week, we are going to take a look at Joseph. And we're going to have a lot of fun with this one. This is going to be a great, great Sunday. Um, For those watching online, it's a great Monday or whatever day it is the week for you. But Mary found herself in a very peculiar situation. Something happened to her that had never happened before and would have been considered impossible. She was a pregnant virgin who was betrothed to a man named Joseph. Now, picking up from last week, how would she explain this to her parents? She, she told the angel, I'm all in. Whatever I got to do, I'm all in. I, I, I got you. I'm with you. I'll, I'm going to carry this mission out. But how would she explain this to her parents? How do, you tell, how do you tell mom and dad what's going on? How would she tell Joseph? Yeah, so what happened was, right? And, and, and what about this close-knit community that she lived in? What would they have thought of her? We're going to get into that a little bit, but again, we're going to spend most of the time talking about Joseph today. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Matthew. The last two weeks we were in Luke. We'll be in Matthew uh, chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, that's where I would like for you to go. That's all. That's the only place we're going to be today is Matthew 1, verse 18. If you do not have your Bibles, it's going to pop up here on the screens in just a moment. The sermon title today is simply this, A Man of Remarkable Character. A man of remarkable character. We're reading from the New Living Translation, the NLT, because I like how it reads when it comes to telling stories, and we're telling an incredible story here this morning. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of of the Holy Spirit, verse 19. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and told I'm sorry, took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Joseph named him Jesus. Can I get an amen for the name above all names, Jesus? Things don't always go perfect during engagements, do they? (laughs) How many of you remember back, those that are married in the room, do you remember back to your engagement time, that that season? Maybe it was brief, maybe it was but a couple weeks, maybe it was 10 years. (laughs) Do you remember that season where the ring was now on the finger and we're going to get married? Things didn't always go perfectly, did they? They didn't always go according to your plan. How many of you have your plan for how things should go? God's got different plans, and sometimes things don't go as we had hoped. And this is what we're kind of seeing in this story. Mary is this probably 14-year-old girl, and Joseph's probably about 18 years old, and they're going to get married, and she's probably working on, you know, what life is going to look like, and life probably looks fairly similar to everybody in her little community. It's a small um, agricultural community that she lives in. There's probably not a lot of surprises. There's nothing worse than getting a phone call from your engaged, betrothed, person, <laughs> that there's been a surprise. There's a hiccup. Something happened. I got a phone call like that when Stacey and I were engaged. 
We were moving into a little apartment in North Lauderdale, uh, down in Broward County, Florida. Uh, we were engaged. She lived with her, her family. I was living with my mom. And we uh, rented this apartment, and we were going to move in. Uh, we were going to go. We were going to get married, go on our honeymoon, come home, and then move in together. Okay? It was a very nice little thing we had going on there. We were pumped, excited. We knew, we thought we knew what was lying before us in the future. Well, I got a phone call from Stacey saying, hey, uh, I'm over here at the apartment because she was decorating. She took all the, the gifts that we had gotten that people had given us in, in the bridal shower, and she's putting them around, and she's starting to decorate. So then when we come home, it's a, it's a home, right? And she says, hey, I've noticed <laughs> there's, there's a couple roaches here in, in this apartment. I said, oh, okay. And I was working for a company called Zep at the time, cleaning company, all kinds of chemicals, and they had a really strong pesticide. And I said, okay, NBD, I'll, I'll come over there and, and I'll spray. It's a concentrate. It's like this big, this, this Zep, Zep uh, pest control. You're supposed to mix it into two gallons. I always mix it into about less than one, like a nice and strong. So I went over there with uh, my friend Frankie, and I went over there and I sprayed this place. I sprayed it all down. I sprayed everything. I said, there's not going to be one roach in this house. How many of you like loathe roaches? They're the worst. They're the worst, right? Especially, these were the big palmetto bugs too. Okay, so these guys, when they, when they move in, they're like bringing like luggage with them and stuff. They're like bringing in a couch and they're like, you see them like backing up and going up the stairs. And I mean, these things are huge, right? And Broward County, I don't know what it's about like Miami-Dade and Broward, but these bugs that are supposed to be this big are like this big down there. I don't know what the deal is. If you're from that area, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so I go in there and I spray this place down. And this is a strong chemical, so I tell Stacy, hey, I, I, I wouldn't uh, go in there anytime soon. Except I forgot to make that phone call. <laughs> so Stacy didn't know that I just sprayed the place down with this pesticide. And so she goes with her sister into the apartment. She's like, oh, it smells pretty strong in here. I guess Kevin sprayed. So her and her sister are unpacking things, and all of a sudden, you know, Roach comes wandering out, and he's, <coughs> and he dies, right? And then another Roach comes out, and same thing, <coughs> and dies, then another roach, then another roach, then 10 roaches, then 20 roaches, then 50 roaches. They came from everywhere. There was a white albino roach. I'm not lying to you. There was roaches from everywhere. She called me freaking out. There's roaches everywhere. I went in like the, the next day because I'm not going in when they're like coming out and dying, right? I'm not trying to fight no roach. So the, so the next day I come and it was like a civil war for like roaches. There were just roach bodies everywhere like you had never seen. They were everywhere and they gotten into all of our new gifts and all of our stuff. And so um, we went down. I went to the office, the apartment place. I'm like, yo, like you put me in a roach nest, man. What's up with that? So they moved us to another place, which was nice. But then we had to like clean all of our brand new like stuff that we had, just all the gifts people had gotten us. And it was just one of those things that you don't expect. I have video of this moment, by the way, that I'm going to find one day and I'll show you guys. I promise. But like, here's the deal. Um, not of the roaches moving, just of the <coughs> dead, right? But here's the thing. Sometimes in our engagement, things just don't go as we expect. Something happened with the dress. Something happened with the, the lease. Something happened with the you fill in the blank. And this was kind of uh, one of those situations, but a much bigger deal. <laughs> this was, oops, I'm pregnant, but not I'm, I, by God. It's, it's just different. Um, and last week, we, we, we talked about um, verse 18 uh, quite a bit. We, we heard Mary's story, and, and Mary never saw this coming, and neither did Joseph. And in and a moment in, in their lives... Their, their lives were changed forever, for eternity. And, and verse 19 tells us Joseph's response. Let's read this one more time. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. And so he, disgraced, he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, we don't have time to go into this. We did this last week, so you can go back and take a look at this last week. Um, but this was an arranged marriage. They were engaged, with, which basically meant th that's it, man. There's a contract in place. You're getting married whether you like it or not at this point. Um, and here's the thing. He here we see in verse 19, Mary wasn't the only one who was going to have to face shame, hurt, disappointment from her family, from her betrothed, from her community. Joseph was going to have to answer all of those, so whatever happened to Mary questions? Joseph says, says that he was a righteous man, a righteous man. That word in the original language, righteous man, is a phrase uh, that, sounds like, that sounds like this, uh, dakaios, dakaios. It means just, observes the law, virtuous, keeps God's commands. In other words, he's a good man. He's a good dude. He's trustable. He's, he's someone you'd want to be around. 
He's someone who you would want your daughter to get to know. Joseph is a good person, a good man. In Luke chapter 1, that tells us that Mary is about four months pregnant when Joseph finds out about all this. A lot of people don't realize that. But, but when Mary and Joseph finally talk and meet, she's four months along in her pregnancy. Is she showing at that point? Maybe, probably, who knows, right? Um, but she went away to spend some time with Elizabeth and Zachariah. So she's with, she's with Elizabeth for a while. So when she comes back, she's four months along in her pregnancy. And um, she is obviously, you know, I, I would imagine she's probably not showing yet, but Joseph has got this plan that he's going to divorce her privately. When Mary comes back, Joseph has a problem on his hands. He loves this girl. He truly loves Mary. He's a good guy. But how can he possibly believe that God impregnated his fiance? It made no sense. And I imagine that he wrestled with this quite a bit. He obviously would have thought, that Mary cheated on him, which was grounds for divorce. I had this kind of cool idea for like a Hallmark Christmas movie starring Mary and Joseph in it, by the way, where like Mary like goes back to her hometown, right? Because I mean, I don't know where she went, but she went to spend time with Elizabeth and maybe she had like some like boy that she used to think was cute back in the day or something, but like they didn't like do anything, but they were just friends. And she's like, no, no, I'm married. Like I'm going to be married, whatever, that type of thing. I don't know. It's just like my, my brain goes places, right? But, but when, jo- when she comes back, either way, Joseph's like, all right, so you've been gone three months. Like, who is he? <laughs> he's nobody. Well, I mean, he's God. No, 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 no. Who is, who's this guy? No, no, he's, he's God. And so she's trying to explain to, to Joseph that, like, no, I promise you, I promise you, Joseph, it was God. He had grounds for divorce. Here's the thing also a lot of people don't realize is that it was also grounds for Mary to be put to death in that culture by stoning Although that didn't happen very often anymore in that culture, it was very much something that they could have done. Now, Joseph's next move would have been to obtain a certificate of divorce. That was, that was the custom. That was what would have happened next, which would have been very public, very official. But instead, he decides to break off the engagement quietly. In order to do that, he would just need two or three witnesses. They do it quietly, and they go about their lives. He cannot marry Mary. He can't. He cannot do this. However, if he went public with this divorce of Mary, she would have been known as impure the rest of her life. And I was thinking about this, and I think about, like, in our culture, the closest thing we have to something like this would be, like, a sexual predator tag, right? Something that you're stamped with, and you have this the rest of your life. Now, obviously, it's different circumstances, but Mary would have been stamped as impure the rest of her life. And she most likely never would have married and would have been subject to public disgrace. So privately divorcing Mary both saves her reputation and potentially her life and would also allow Joseph to maintain his personal righteousness according to the law. Joseph had compassion on Mary. He loved her. He was in love with her. But he also believed that she cheated on him. Joseph had a plan. He thought it through. And it seemed to be the best plan that he could come up with. Joseph was a good man. If you don't see his goodness here, you're missing something. But he was going to divorce her. Yeah. What would you do in his situation? He had every right to go public with this thing and blow the roof off of it. Publicly shame her, publicly disgrace her, and he did none of that. He said, I'm just going to keep this small, private, we're going to move on, we're going to move forward, you go your way. I'll go my way. He's a good man. He's got good character. But as we see in verse 20, it says, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Here we have another angelic encounter. We don't know who this angel is, but yes, it it could have been Gabriel. Many people speculate Gabriel kind of had the whole, like, project Jesus being born, right? So he was doing all the angelic encounters. We don't know, and honestly, in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't matter. 
But when the angel's talking, he refers to Joseph as son of David. And remember, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come through the bloodline of David. So this is important. And the angels, that's why one of the reasons the angel drops this phrase in there to help Joseph understand you have strong lineage. You have the bloodline of David, which is where the bloodline of the Messiah is going to come from. But then the angel says this here. He says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And what the angel is, is, is really telling Joseph here is this. Don't be afraid about the consequences and stigmas that could be attached to him because of this pregnancy. If Joseph's going to listen to this angel, if he's to take Mary as his wife, who knows what people are going to say about him, think about him, excommunicate him, you name it. And the angel says to him, don't worry. I got this. Just do what I'm asking you to do. Then the angel confirmed to Joseph what he had already told Mary. And it's interesting that he says this phrase in there. I don't know if you saw this or not, but at the end, for he will save his people from their sins. And this is a big deal, and I don't have time to get into this today. I've talked about this before. A lot of the Jewish people were raiding on the Messiah to set them free from Roman oppression, um, but that was never the plan of God or his son Jesus. The plan always, all along, was to save mankind from their sins, from their shortcomings, from their separation with God. The plan of Jesus coming in was to build that broken bridge, to rebuild that broken bridge back straight to the heart of the Father. That's why Jesus came. That's the whole purpose and the whole reason. And that's why this angel says this, for he will save his people from their sins. From the get-go, he wanted people to know that Jesus was not coming to rescue them from Roman oppression but from something a whole lot worse, their own sins. Verse 22 and 23, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This was all prophesied years prior. Joseph would have been aware of this stuff. He would have known these verses. He would have known his text. He would have known his scripture. He would have known about these prophecies. And this is stuff that was all prophesied years before. When that angel began to quote that verse, Joseph would have said, yeah, I I know that. I I, I learned that as a little boy. And depending on how you interpret scriptures, there are over 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. He was coming he, he was coming. He was on his way. In Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve have that fallout and that fall of mankind, and God says, I got a plan for this. We're going to fix this. I'm going to send my son. And it was in that moment that God began to get, prepare his son. Hey, you're going to have to go. At some point in time, you're going to have to go. At some point in time, you're going to have to have your blood shed for all of mankind. And so for those couple thousand years leading up to the birth of Christ, he was coming. And the prophets kept prophesying, he's coming. He's coming. The Messiah is coming. And if you were a Jewish person in that day and age, you would have been all in on that. You would have completely bought in on that. But again, the problem is you were thinking more he's going to set you free from your oppression of the Romans. But no, it was all about saving us from sin. Verse 24 and 25, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Joseph awakes from his dream and makes Mary his wife. I I have a feeling it happened pretty quickly. I mean, you have a dream like that. You have an encounter like that. Well, first of all, your fiance has already been telling you, yeah, God impregnated me. Yeah, right, whatever. Then an angel comes and visits you in a dream and was like, yeah, she wasn't lying. Like, that's what happened. Now, like, why wait at that point? And it wasn't long after that that Joseph and Mary have this, have this wedding and they, 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 they become husband and wife. And I can almost see Mary looking at Joseph saying, I tried telling you. <laughs> I told you so. Joseph waits sometime after Jesus is born to have sexual relations with Mary, which makes sense to me. Also, it allowed Mary some, some, the, the opportunity to continue to be a virgin until the Christ child was born. That's the story. That's the story of Joseph finding out about the Christ child, that he was going to be the father of Jesus. He was going to raise this boy. But there's some things in this story that really just jump out to me. 
I mentioned a couple of them already, but there's some things in here that as I was preparing this message and studying and kind of praying through this, um, one of the things is this, is just how good of a guy Joseph was. Now, we know that good, you know, only gets you so far in life. We know that, you know, our goodness will always fall short, and that's where God's grace kicks in. But, but either way, Joseph was a very good man. He, the, 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 the angel said he was righteous. And I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm in that season of being a father um, and having young children. I ask myself this question, would God entrust me with raising his son? Like, Joseph was such a good person. When the Lord said to Mary, you're going to give birth to my child, it wasn't just her that was called, right? It wasn't just her that was put on mission, but it was Joseph as well. And God didn't need just Mary, but he needed a good man, a man of remarkable character to raise his son. Let that question linger for a moment to those of us in the room still raising children, kind of in that next gen age, that zero to 18, zero to 24, 25, I don't know, 30, whatever, the fellas out there. Could God entrust you to raise his son? Do you provide a, a godly home for your children? A safe home? Do you work hard to provide? You know, I'm thinking if God was going to trust, if the Father was going to trust Jesus in the home of Joseph, he knew that Joseph was going to work hard, that Joseph wouldn't go hungry. He knew that he would be safe. He knew that he would be loved. He knew that he would be treasured. He knew that Joseph would view Jesus as an absolute blessing. And you may be saying, yeah, yeah, I get it, but that's because it's Jesus. Let's call it what it is, right? No, 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 no. Your son, your daughter that was given to you, was also the mission you were tasked with. I'm not preaching to just you. I'm talking to myself, too. Could I do it? Would God entrust me to raise his son? Man, that's a hard question. I struggle with being tender sometimes. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands for any of the fellas in the room that also struggle with this. It's just something that... I grew up in a home where saying I love you was weak, crying was weak, being empathetic or compassionate to anyone was considered a weakness. And, and that's, that's kind of how I sort of grew, grew up. My father passed away when I was six years old, but by that time, things in my family were kind of icy and kind of cold growing up. A lot of teasing. You know, that type of stuff. And, and for me, I, because of my, my, nur- because of my nurture, right, how I was raised, uh, sometimes I, I lack tenderness. And I hate it. A few years back, I was just kind of really in one of those seasons where I was praying and just seeking the Lord and like, God, I just want to be a better dad. I want to be a, a better husband. I want to be a better, you know, whatever that is. And I had this word dropped into my spirit. He just said, you need to be tender. <laughs> okay, I'm going to need your help with that. Because <laughs> it's just not, it's not intuitive to me. I'm sharing with you and being transparent with you, but men, take a moment. What is it you lack? What, what is it that if, if, if you could, if you could wave a spiritual magical wand and just improve this area of yourself, what would it be? When I read the story of Joseph, I read a tender man. His fiance comes back and she's pregnant and she says, God did this to me. I mean, let's, yeah, we think, oh, that's crazy, that's funny, whatever. That's almost like a slap in the face, too. Like, no, like, woman up. Tell me, who was it? <laughs> right? No. No, it was God that did this to me. And in that moment, he, had, he could have completely shamed her. But instead, I see him wrestling with this. Like, I love this woman so much. Not only, it's not only just about her, but it's about me. I'm, I'm a righteous person. I'm a good man. And I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to shame her. And then this angel comes along. And this angel says, no, no, what she said is right. 
And so Joseph, Joseph marries her, and then the, the, the son is born, and we're going to get into this, right, because we're doing this chronological search, but I, I, I imagine, I don't know about you, but like I imagine when, when Joseph is doing his carpentry and he's, he's, he's teaching his son, it's not, would you pass me the screwdriver, right? No, I, I imagine it's more like, hey, son, come here, let me show you something, let me show you this cool angle. Let me show you how you cut this piece of wood here. Look, look, here, now, here, I want you to do it. I want you to try. No, you can do it. No, don't say you can't do it. You can do it, son. You can do it. You got this. You've got calling on your life. You've got purpose on your life. You're a good boy. You know how much, you know much daddy loves you? Do we say these things to our kids? Man, I hope you read into your, to your sons and the daughters at night, fathers. I hope you're taking time with your kids. And, and, and ladies, this isn't just for the fellas, right? This is for all of us. Being tender, being kind. One of the things we've tried to, to really live by in our home, one of the things that we've really said, this is, this is if we could pick a word to define the Hockenberry family, we, we want it to be kindness. We want to be known as people that treat people right, that love people. No matter where they come from, what they look like, man, we want to be kind to people, hospitable. Joseph was tender to Mary. And in the most difficult situation of his life, his character shined. The name of today's message is a, a man of remarkable character. <laughs> but in the most difficult situation of his life, his character shined. You know, they say you can tell a lot about a man, a lot about a woman, about how they behave when things break bad. Joseph didn't have roaches in his apartment, as bad as that is, as awful as that is. He was dealing with something on a much bigger scale. And how he responded showed a lot about who he is, didn't it? And it's the same thing with us, man. Like you're going to go through things. You're going to experience things. You're going to walk through difficult times. And how you respond and how you react in those times reveals so much about who you truly are and who your character is. Does our character shine? Do we lose our cool? Joseph could have easily ruined Mary's life, but instead he just decided to treat her right. We're going to close in prayer in just a minute. I hope when you hear a sermon like this, you feel encouraged and you feel challenged. You feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Conviction is just letting you know there's a problem, right? It's not guilt. It's not shame. So if you heard me say anything this morning that felt shameful or you're walking away feeling guilty about something, that is not how God operates and that's not what I intended. But when I preach, when anybody preaches on this stage on a Sunday morning, I'm hoping that there's something in that sermon that's going to make you say, I want to get a little bit closer to God. How can I be a little bit more like Jesus? How can I walk out of this place and be just a little bit different than, than before I walked in? Amen? So this morning, we're going we're gonna to end, and we're going to have some prayer workers up here again before we take off. But um, if there's something in this message that really struck a chord with you that you need prayer about, um, I, I challenge you before you leave, you got plenty of time, you know, before the NFL games start and all that fun stuff, right? you got plenty of time to check your fantasy football lineup. I, I promise it's only 11-something, 11 11-38. Don't leave. If God has... has has spoken to you this morning and you know that you need prayer about something, don't leave. Amen? This isn't just about getting better. <laughs> this isn't just about being good. But this is about coming before the Lord and saying, God, I was challenged in this area of my life and I can't do this on my own. I need your help. I shared with you about me and, and this desire to be more tender. I can't do that on my own. I can't give my kids what I don't have. And that's why I go to the Lord and say, God, can you give me what I don't have? Because I need this. Because my kids need this. My wife needs this. Amen? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We're three weeks in, God, and, and we still really haven't talked about Jesus a whole lot yet. <laughs> in a sermon series that's a chronological look at his life. But I think in order to understand the man, you have to understand his family and where he came from. And so, Lord, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to a humble place, 
Nazareth, where it was said that nothing good ever comes from Nazareth. Thank you for Mary and for Joseph. What a wonderful home he would have been raised in. And God, I know there's some of us in this room that we, uh, we didn't come from the best upbringing. There might be some teenagers in this room that maybe they're not in the best situation right now. And sometimes we don't know how to give or sometimes we're, we cannot give what we don't have. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just speak to us right where we're at in our seat. Because where we are short, God, you're right there. You're our portion. You make up the deficit. And so, Lord, I know that you want to do some lives, some things in some people's lives this morning before they leave. Let us not rush out of this place if we need to talk to you. We love you so much, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.